Okay, so um, I'd like to talk about uh, the Seneschal project, which uh, recently finished, uh, undertaken by uh, ourselves at the uh, University of South Wales, uh, in conjunction with uh, English Heritage, uh, the two Royal Commissions, and the Archaeology Data Service. I'll just talk a little bit about uh, the deliverables, or what, what we were set out to achieve, what we did achieve, what we maybe didn't achieve. Um, so a whistle-stop tour, tour. So the first thing I want to do before getting into the kind of technology area is talk about what the problems are. So it's an interesting exercise. If you searched in Google on the wives of Henry VIII and then clicked on images, see if we can spot the problem in the top results that we get back from the biggest search company on the entire planet. Okay. So instantly, we've got a little insight into how Google's actually working because it's doing a little magic trick and it's making us believe that it knows what we mean. It, 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 it knows exactly what we mean. But actually, just indexing using words is ambiguous. And so if we're, they're used in metadata indexing, then there's an inherent possibility of ambiguity in the results. So Google's performing a kind of illusion. It's an impressive magic trick. We're make, it's making us believe we, we type in what we want and we get back things. It's understood us. All it's really done is done some statistical calculations on the juxtaposition of words in documents. Yeah. So true meaning is not really built into the resources they're indexing. Um, it's just where the words are next to each other. Um, so the task of ambiguity resolution gets delegated back to the user. So we need to look at this and say, right, well, we know this is one of the wives of Henry VIII. We know this one isn't. Yeah. Um, so Google has done a lot of the hard work there because it's made the association between the phrase wives of Henry VIII and Jane Seymour. But it's failed in the last, last little bit because it didn't really understand the data that it was handling. Okay. Um, now, the problem we come across all the time, particularly in archaeological data sets, or I say particularly, but it's, it's uh, prevalent, um, incompatible terminology when we're trying to describe things. And so it hinders cross-search. A lot of the projects we've been working on have been dealing with trying to cross-search data sets from different organizations. And when you try and do that, people are describing things in different ways, um, and you end up with a lot of difficulty at a low level of trying to uh, match things up. So we've seen that indexing using just words is always going to be potentially ambiguous. Um, but also you've got this consistency issue, where even if you're trying to use the same words, you're not always using quite the same words. And if the data is not used in a consistent way, if these words aren't used in a consistent way, then every time we want to reuse this data, our applications have to solve the same problems. So if you have a look at that table on the right, if you wanted to find all the Iron Age post holes and they were described in this way, then we've got a lot of problems to solve straight away. Um, and we either need to go through a data cleansing uh, process or we need to construct quite a complicated query to account for all of these possibilities. And the problem here is in the use of text to try to convey meaning. What do we mean when we're searching for, for post hole? And what do we mean when we're searching for Iron Age? Uh, whereas the, the underlying concepts that these, these records are trying to describe are the same. Yeah. But it's going to be really difficult to find all of these records without a very unnecessarily big query. So what we want to be able to do in both search and indexing is to say what we really mean and not just use words to describe these things because they're inadequate. So is there a way to indicate what we mean without using words? Could we reference something that um, unambiguously represents what we mean rather than trying to use a word to describe it? Could we devise some way of identifying it that's globally unique to the things we want to reference? Yes, we can. We've already got that mechanism. It already exists. It's the web. We can piggyback that architecture and reuse it for data, not just pages. Yeah. So there's an example of a resource that describes Jane Seymour. It's globally unique. It's globally referenceable. It's available 24-7. And if we refer to it, then we know we're referring to the wife of Henry VIII and not Dr. Quinn Medicine Woman. Okay. And if we go there, let's see if that works. We've got some information. 
Yeah, and so it, it links to further information. Yeah, and if we went to some of these links, they would link to further information. So we've got a network of data using exactly the same architecture as the existing web, but describing pieces of data rather than web pages. Yeah. Let's get rid of all this rubbish. So there's a mechanism we could use to unambiguously describe things. You might say, well, we don't have these problems because all of our data is already neat and tidy. It's all clean, and we, we refer to internal vocabularies. That's all very nice. It's great. Um, but our project was considering issues of wider interoperability. So we weren't looking at searching within one data set. We're looking at searching across data sets. And even when a vocabulary has been used, words are ambiguous for indexing. And so tenement in the Scottish monument type thesaurus is a big building containing a number of rooms or flats. Whereas a tenement in the English heritage monument types thesaurus is a parcel of land. So we can't automatically disambiguate search results originating from two separate sources if all they've used are words to describe these things. But if they've used thesaurus concepts unambiguously identified using some sort of identifier mechanism, then we know that these two things are different because we've got some background information attached to them. Yeah. And when we reference them and say it's HTTP XYZ version of Tenement, then everyone in the world knows which one I'm talking about. Yeah. So if we can supplement our data with identifiers that represent these concepts, it becomes very clear what we mean by Tenement. Yeah. And we can express our search criteria more accurately. So what the Senatorial Project was trying to do was to put existing control vocabularies online in a machine-readable way. Uh, so we, we had these commonly agreed concepts, terminology, and identifiers, putting them online in a consistent standard format, making them available, very importantly, using an open licensing arrangement so that people could use this data and incorporate it into their own applications. Uh, we made the data, data available um, as linked data, which I'll, I'll talk a little bit about. Also, as web services, there's um, uh, predefined functionality that you can just call using a web uh, address. And then we also created a number of uh, data entry and lookup tools that actually use this data and put them into nice forms that you can slot into your, your web page. So you're, you're using the vocabulary in the background. And so that rather than trying to solve these recurring vocabulary problems, we can help to stop them from happening in the first place. So that when you're typing a, into a field, you can have a drop-down list of vocabulary concepts coming from a controlled vocabulary. And so we're not just entering a word, we've got the word displayed, but in the background we've got the identifier of that concept that the word represents. So what is linked data? Um, well, it's ba basically just <coughs> linking things together, making them available on the web in a machine-readable way, and then creating uh, machine-readable links between them. So, if we looked at the, uh, the dim bones thing, toe bone connected to the foot bone, foot bone connected to the heel bone, we could represent that knowledge that's encompassed in that text by having concepts that represent each of those items and saying that they're connected to each other. Yeah. And so, linked data is expressing the data in a format called RDF, Resource Description Framework, and then we're using um, addresses, web addresses, as identifiers for these things. And hopefully, when you go to that address, you get back some information about that thing. So you can be confident it's, it's really what you mean. Does it look familiar to us? It's exactly the same architecture as the existing web. But instead of pages that point to other pages, we've got data items that point to other data items. Yeah, so we can make our information available on the web worldwide, and everybody else can point to it and say, this is what I mean when I mean tenement. So a quick primer of what RDF is. Um, you have statements or triples that cons consist of three parts. So you could say that TACOS takes place in University of York. Yeah. And then the object of the triple could uh, be an identifier which in turn can point to other things. Uh, and you can express a chain of relationships um, as a series of triples forming a kind of graph structure. So you can have a series of statements 
And you note at the moment, there's no real technology. This is just text. But what it encodes is a knowledge structure. And then we could append additional information to it. So we could say, these things, Tacos took place in University of New York, attended by myself, also attended by Phil Carlyle. We could say other things about Phil Carlyle, couldn't we, and attach them to that node. <laughs> yeah. Any suggestions? <laughs> so, but that's just a, a kind of an idiosyncratic model. I've, I've said it, located in, took place in, attended by, what do those things actually mean? We need some sort of formal model that we can adhere to in order for it to really make any sense. Otherwise, we're just back to the point of all having our own data structures. Uh, so there are structures out there that we can use to describe things. And what we used for the, uh, the linked data of the vocabularies was something called SCOS, Simple Knowledge Organization System. This basically encodes a number of different types of things and relationships between them that uh, forms a kind of polyhierarchical structure. So you can have concepts which are related to other concepts through broader, narrower, related relationships. And each concept then might have labels attached to it in different languages. I might have scope notes attached to them. Okay. Um, and so we can build up um, gazetteers, uh, word lists, classifications, thesauri, these kind of structures using that very simple approach. Okay. What we can also do is to accommodate colloquial terms. So here's uh, Blackadder meeting Dr. Johnson, who announces that he's got a, word, a book that contains every single word in the language. And so Blackadder says, right, um, I offer my most enthusiastic contrafibularities. And Dr. Johnson, uh, uh, and he starts uh, thumbing through his book feverishly. And Blackadder says, well, this is a common word, Dan, aren't we? And so Dr. Johnson's very upset and starts scribbling in his book. So this mischievous suggestion might be a new term, but it's not a new concept. We could attach it into the existing concept structure. If we have an existing concept that's online somewhere that's described and we can have labels for it, we could add a new label to that concept, which means pretty much the same thing. Okay. And so we did this in terms of uh, um, <coughs> concept structures for, for the archaeological thesauri. So in the case of the monuments thesaurus for Scotland, we've got English terms, but we've also got uh, Scottish Gaelic terms attached to the concepts. What that allows us to do is to, instead of using terms to use concepts, it allows us to search in one language and retrieve in another, because we're thinking in, along the lines of the concepts. So what we've got online at the moment is a number of uh, vocabularies from English Heritage, Scottish and Welsh commissions, trying to move from term-based thinking into concept-based thinking. And then we can start to create links between concepts from different vocabularies, we create uh, knowledge, start to create um, links between data sets, between sites, maybe even between countries, start to create a, a vast graph of knowledge. And we can also do alignment between thesauri, so that when I say tomato and you say tomato, we can make a link between them and say these things are roughly the same thing. And so when I'm saying it, I can traverse that link and find all the things that use the word that you say. And we're getting towards true interoperability there um, of multilingual resources. So here's a quick extract. I can't really see that very well um, of what we've got online at the Heritage Data site, where we've got these, these vocabularies made available as linked data. A little search facility uh, for, for any one of those concepts then you've got a whole host of properties that these things have got um, and now that's just a, a human readable version of the data that's exposed there's also a machine readable version that you can get to so you can ingest this data straight into your own applications so rather than just display it like that you can have it displayed uh, in your own system. Now what we wanted to do then was to go a stage further and say well we're not just exposing that data and leaving you to it, we want to create some sort of controls that you can embed into your own systems or at least some examples of them to show what can be done. So we have some, some web services that en encompass uh, predefined functionality and so you go to one of these addresses and what you get back is a block of data um, that represents uh, what you've asked for obviously. 
number of different service calls there. And then on top of that, we have some little user interface controls, what you refer to as widgets, um, that can be embedded into your own web page to give you extended functionality uh, to use these vocabularies within your own applications. They're all open source. They're all made available for people to take and pull apart and create new ones as, as, as they wish. They're only using our own web services as their data source. So we're not using any particular magic there. Um, we're using the same things that are made available to everybody else, eating our own dog food, as it were. Um, and they're configurable to work with specific concept schemes. So if you wanted something that searched on the MDA object thesaurus, you could also have something that searched on the monument type thesaurus uh, and, and other thesauri that are made available. And we've got a number of online working example pages. So here's an example of some of the things we've got. Um, the scheme widgets, where the scheme represents a, a thesaurus. Uh, so we've got uh, one that lists all the schemes that are available at the moment. For any one of them, you might have some details of it, uh, and then put together into, into a little composite control, see if we can get that working there. Okay, so there we go. So that has just pulled the data from the Heritage Data site, and it's given us oh, come on, a list of all the possible schemes in the system. And for each of them, then, we've got the top concepts, the root ones in the hierarchy, and a little description. So as we go to go there, we can get some more information about them. Okay. Same for the concepts themselves. This is where it gets a little bit more interesting, um, because we can put up information that we can navigate through um, the concept structures that are available online. Uh, so we've got one that just shows us uh, some details of the concept, the various different labels that are used to describe it, scope notes, um, one describing the relationships from these concepts to others, and one that just pulls them together into a kind of composite control. Now, if we went there and had a look, so we've got the bow brooch, and we've got relationships to other concepts in there. And so as we click on them, yeah, it tells us what we selected, but it also navigates through the concept structure, so we can go a bit narrower, yeah, we can go broader, up through brooch, jewelry, anklet. Yeah, so we're starting to navigate around that hierarchical structure. And these, these are little controls that can just be embedded. This, this is an example page where I've embedded it onto the page. You can just view source and, and copy it, have it on your own website. Um, one of the more useful ones, um, is the term suggestion control that we have here, uh, where it gives you this kind of uh, drop-down suggestion a la Google. So as you start typing, it starts giving you terms from the control vocabularies. Um, so let's see if we can get that working. OK, so I've got a number of controls on the screen there. Um, originally, this was just a web page with some input boxes, but You'll see if you, do, if you do view source on here, you can see what I've done. I've just attached um, a little script to it to make these things interactive. So now instead of just allowing text entry, you can start to get suggestions from the vocabularies. Yeah. And you can see down on the bottom left, as I, as I highlight over these, we've got the actual addresses of these things. So they're not just terms, they're actually the concepts themselves. And once we start using these, we can all start talking the same language when we're talking about axes and microscopes and barrows, rather than just using the word itself, which is inherently ambiguous, as we've seen. So I mentioned that they're also um, using different vocabularies. So, so the same type of control can be configured to get the data from different vocabularies. So we've got one from the archaeological objects thesaurus, archaeological sciences thesaurus, uh, monument types. Yeah, oh, I don't know. Yeah, and in the background, when I selected it, we also had an identifier we could use in our system to record the fact that we selected this term, but in the background, we actually selected this concept. We might have a number of terms associated with it. Okay, okay. So, in terms of early adoption of this, um, this was quite a 
a short-term project. It was a 12-month project. So we were um, uh, surprised to see that there was um, some early adoption straight away of using these resources as soon as we put them up. Um, first of all, uh, Dan Fett of the Portable Antiquity Scheme started incorporating the URIs of these concepts into um, the data there. And you can see uh, we've actually got URIs of con equivalent concepts in the British Museum's linked data because they've, they've had an exercise of putting their data online. So there's some very early uh, adoption of these things, uh, which is really encouraging to see. Also, one of the... Uh, <coughs> Uh, the, the, sorry, this is the ADS um, incorporating these things into their, their background CMS system um, where they had a kind of drop-down list where you, you, you uh, type things in. You can't really see them that well, but it's, it's getting the data again from these, these control vocabularies rather than just allowing free text entry, which can be error-prone, and at the end of it you've just got a word with no connection to anything else. And then finally, the Cluid Powers Archaeological Trust, uh, where one of their developers um, picked these things up and started to create a mobile application, a field recording application, where he had a little drop-down thing where you started um, selecting from the vocabularies again for your monument type. Yeah, so, again, rather than just having text in the field, it was giving you the option to select a concept that would be globally known to everybody. So everybody know, knows if you selected movable bridge, everybody in the world knows what you're talking about because you can actually go to that URI and get all the other information about it. Okay. So what are the next steps for us? Well, we want to identify potential applications and uses for these things across the domain. Um, we hopefully want to incorporate other vocabularies, particularly linked between vocabularies. We've got uh, a number of different monuments, the Sorai, a number of different objects, the Sorai, um, and of, uh, other linked data resources as well outside. We've got uh, DBpedia and, and uh, GeoNames and things like this. So there's, there's opportunities to link between all of these things, uh, hopefully creating useful links to other resources, and maybe some more of these predefined user interface widgets that we can create that can be slotted into web pages. Um, because we created ones that we thought would be useful, but it'd be very nice to hear what other people think are useful. Maybe none of those, maybe something else completely, but uh, it'd be nice to incorporate more more of those. So that's just a little uh, outline of the things that we, we managed to achieve in, in that project. And hopefully you'll find all those resources really useful uh, in your own work. And so there's a uh, web page of where you can, you can go to and get uh, details of the services and the, the widgets and, and download them and use them. And that's it. Yep. Thank you.